I'll keep the music on here. Um, our next session will focus on uh, business aircraft storage and its implications on aircraft maintenance. Discussing this topic will be Richard Gardner, a regional manager for Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia for Duncan Aviation. We also have Phil Bomber, Director of Maintenance at TAG Aviation Asia. Richard is joining us from New Zealand and Phil from Hong Kong. Uh, Phil and Richard, uh, the floor is yours. Meeting. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the uh, maintenance uh, topic for the uh, ASBA safety uh, seminar. We uh, really appreciate that you could join us today. Um, it's a very uh, sometimes maintenance is not the most exciting topic in the world, but we're hoping to uh, share a little bit about our thoughts to do with safety. And right now, the, the hot issue is, of course. Uh, aircraft maintenance uh, storage. So a lot of aircraft are parked right now. We believe this is a major safety issue. So we'd like to, uh, we'd like to basically cover a little bit of that and uh, get some opinions. And uh, we would very much like if during the, the presentation from Richard and myself, you'd be able to put forward your questions uh, via text. Uh, and uh, we'd be very happy to answer those uh, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, so, uh, if I could just start, I'm with uh, TAG Aviation Asia, we're a large aircraft management company, we're also uh, performing uh, maintenance, uh, Macau, Hong Kong, also we have our FBO in Macau, uh, so yeah, we're, we're doing, um, we're, we're looking after a lot of different aircraft types, a lot of aircraft models, both performing maintenance and doing the camo. Uh, so that's my int introduction, if I could just hand it over to Richard for a quick introduction of himself. Great, uh, thanks Phil. Um, good afternoon everybody from uh, not so sunny New Zealand, but anyway, uh, great to be here this afternoon. Yes, um, my name is Richard Gardner. As I said, I've uh, looked after Australia, New Zealand and up into Southeast Asia for Duncan for about uh, 10 years, I guess, and always enjoy getting up to your part of the world. So for those of you who don't know, Duncan Aviation is the largest family owned um, MRO business in the business aviation in the world. We have three main US locations in Lincoln, Nebraska, Battle Creek, Michigan, and Provo, Utah. So we've done a lot of work for customers from up in Asia, but um, really do appreciate that business. And um, yeah, just a great pleasure to be here this afternoon. So thank you very much. Uh, Richard, sorry to interrupt here. Uh, do you think you can try uh, going full screen in your presentation? I think um, I'm seeing some of the uh, next slide and also notes as well. So I just want to make sure the audience can see the full screen. Okay, just let me go back because it should be no on. Rush. Try that. Is that better? There you go. Yep, yeah. There you go. This Thank works you. now. Yep. Right. Okay, next slide, please. So Richard's in control of the slides today. So I'll be uh, getting his assistance on some of that. Okay, so back to the topic at hand. Uh, key point is safety. Right now, we've got unprecedented times. Um, the aircraft in our region have been heavily affected due to COVID-19. Uh, this is not a new topic, but it's something that's ongoing. And this can really, this is really beginning to affect the safety of uh, some of our fleet. So we believe this is something that needs to be highlighted. One of the key points is that in, com in countries such as say US or even well, luckily for us, mainland China, a lot of the flying has returned to a reasonable level. Um, you know, we're hearing figures of 80% plus uh, pre-COVID times, uh, sometimes higher, but there are certainly some aircraft that are parked due to financial situations. Uh, on top of that, in Asia, when you're talking about countries, uh, particular Hong Kong, Singapore, and many others, uh, they're, they're relatively small countries and every flight is international. So those, those uh, geographies are much more affected than others. Uh, and I think the majority of our uh, countries within Asia, uh, we're suffering a lot of uh, flight restrictions and the flying uh, patterns are, you know, 30% or less of where it was pre-COVID in some situations, even worse, some slightly better. So we really do have a heavy impact of the flying schedule, a lot of aircraft parked. Uh, and, and the question of today's presentation is what is 
the impact to safety in the situation. Next one, please, Richard. So what are the storage considerations? Um, essentially, there's a couple of ways to look at this. There's your short-term or active storage, uh, and then there's the longer-term storage. Uh, some, every single OEM seems to do it slightly differently than the other, and there's also airframe OEM, engine OEM, uh, with different requirements. But essentially, you know, you've got the short-term situation, it transitions into a, a medium term, and then in some cases, a much longer long-term situation. Uh, and, and all of them require different activities to keep the aircraft, uh, you know, in good shape during this period. So when this is happening, you know, who is going to do the work and where? Where are you going to park the aircraft? And when we want to return the aircraft to service, what's the reliability going to be like? What are we going to do to ensure the aircraft can continue to fly and safely? Uh, on top of that, there are some non-maintenance related issues like the crew currency. Um, and uh, there are some commercial considerations as well that we're going to touch on very briefly. Uh, and then, of course, you know, long-term storage, putting aircraft out of service, keeping the aircraft flight ready. Um, you know, what are the, what are the, what's the framework? How do we decide what to do and look after our aircraft during this period of time? So I can hand over to you now, Richard. So thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, one of the interesting parts is is really that storage timeline, and and it's been really interesting through this whole pandemic. Is um, I think that everyone, you know, when we started, we felt like this may not last that long and, it, and it's really been an evolving situation. So we'll go through some of that. As you know, short-term parking is what everybody sees in operating business jets. It's just your standard every day. What do you do when you go on a business trip or, you know, family holidays, that sort of things for the principals. So you're all very used to that. And then that's kind of gone into the longer term parking and the active storage. And we've definitely seen that that's the most common thing that everybody is doing. And with some operators and especially guys that I've talked to up in Asia, the low utilization customers for some of the management companies or flight departments that have got very low utilization, they would actually be in this eight to sort of 60 day mark as their part of their normal operation. It's nothing to do with COVID or it's just how, how they work. And then, yeah, we're looking at that sort of voluntary put out a service. That's really much more common in the airlines. And to be honest, it does exist in the book, but um, I'm yet to come across someone who's actually gone and put their aircraft, you know, really buttoned it up and put it away for storage. So the active storage is, like I said, it's the most common thing. We've definitely seen a lot of flight departments. It is quite different between the, the people who run just their own flight department versus, say, a management company looking after several airplanes. But certainly a lot of companies, if they're in a flight department, they've got people working from home. They really are only coming in when required some places like Phil mentioned in the US, you've seen where the domestic flying has picked up. So for them, it's really been they'll only come in if there's a flight. But in typical times, you know, it's really thinking about people have been keeping away from each other because of COVID restriction, of course, and that's part of that safety aspect. Um, people are also doing split shifts trying to keep uh, situations where they're not getting cross-contamination if someone does get infected with COVID. One of the things that you really need to consider as part of that, and it's a little bit like a lot of maintenance anyway, is a very accurate handover. Um, one of the main features that we've heard about is because people are not working at it all day, every day, the same as they did before, things can be easily lost, things you can easily, things that you normally would do as part of your standard, like coming to work pre-flight, where you go. Because that's out of the norm, we're seeing those opportunities for safety slip-ups there. So we do have to be quite careful. Um, one of the other situations that really operators have talked about is thinking about going into that long-term storage. And like I said, I haven't seen anyone do that yet. But it's a really, it's not just um, tape up the airplane and walk away. It really is a much bigger exercise. 
And a lot of people, A, they just don't know when they're going to fly again, but it comes down to it's kind of more trouble than it's worth. So you really need to take that into a consideration if that's what you're thinking of doing. Um, one of the other things that's quite an interesting part of this is really that the whole pandemic has driven the slowdown in flying and it's something we really haven't seen since probably the, um, the GFC in 2008. And the 2008 GFC, there was a lot of learnings came out of that and um, preservation requirements. Some of it was driven by financial burdens, which people, you know, they kind of maybe shouldn't have been in the business aviation world anyway, because they kind of couldn't afford it. And, and airplanes were just left to sit. And that's something that we've seen this time has been a big improvement. People have been a lot more aware of requirements. And I think as we'll go through later on with some of the commercial considerations, people have seen the results of not doing it properly. So you need to really think about having a good plan. It's all in the book. It's all there in chapter 10 of the maintenance manual, but it's something just to be thinking about. So as Phil said, one of the big parts of it is like where, when, who, that sort of thing. And where is it going to be parked? I mean, I've seen certainly a lot of the US flight departments they have their own hangars, that sort of thing. That's fine, you know, in those organizations, it's not such a big problem. But when you look at uh, Hong Kong, for example, you mean parking, especially hangar parking is very restricted. And it's something that you have to consider that this is in a lot of ways has gone on longer than we thought. And there are issues coming up like storms and weather conditions that when we all thought we were going to be out of this in two months time, the tornado season wasn't really a problem. But now suddenly we're a lot further down the track. And, and that's really something that we need to consider, you know, and I'm sure that um, up there, Phil and your team have really seen a lot more of that sort of, uh, that sort of thing where we weren't expecting to be where we are today. Yes, correct. Uh, we, we've certainly had uh, some exciting times here with a, a couple of typhoons that were fairly close to uh, passing nearby Hong Kong. Uh, the parking here, the airport authority was actually very accommodating and uh, because we're way out, we're way over capacity for a period of time there. Uh, the airport adapted, uh, let the parking go on, uh, but there was a lot of hoops being jumped through by the Hong Kong BAC and, and, uh, and ASBA about, okay, how do we get aircraft out if a typhoon comes? Uh, we have very limited uh, hangar parking here. Actually, it's always full, it's always been full. Uh, so, you know, and if we have to get the aircraft out, where do we go? The countries that have restrictions can we get into those countries can we not get into those countries how far do we need to take the airplanes so okay. it, it's definitely been um, uh, quite interesting but fortunately uh, the the authority here was uh, working with us uh, with asba to you know accommodate our specific situation that has reduced somewhat uh, over the last couple of three months uh, with the, some flying regaining or restarting um, but it's, it's always an ongoing situation about a parking limitation in Hong Kong. Furthermore, when people were talking about two or three months of uh, maybe parking the aircraft, now it's extended to much longer. People are still interested. They might, they say, maybe I won't fly until, uh, let's say, February or March next year. Uh, so I might look at a, a location to park the aircraft that's uh, more economically feasible. Hong Kong is not the cheapest place to park. So this is another discussion that's been going on in this area. That's certainly, thanks Phil, that's certainly something that um, I've seen in the discussions as well was about it's great moving your aircraft to another location, but then you've really got to think about, well, who's going to do the work on and do that maintenance when it's there? Um, I even had a customer from the US that was talking to come to New Zealand and they um, here you have to be a, a uh, citizen to get in the country because of the COVID restrictions, all that sort of thing. And they were going to send a G550 down. And it's for them, of course, they can't just pop down and come and look after the airplane because it was an American mechanic. So you're starting to try and find local support you know, who's going to do that work? Where am I going to keep it? 
and are they qualified and all that sort of thing. So I've certainly seen those questions come, people thinking they're going to go to the islands for a bit of time, and then you even run into, well, what am I going to do about that? So it really is, there's a lot more to it, and of course that does have an impact on safety. Um, so really, yeah, it's just something to be really mindful of. I, I do think maybe this is an outside looking in view, but perhaps we feel that up in Asia, you've actually had a few events a little bit like this with the bird flu and all that sort of thing. And, and you've sort of seen a little bit more of the, what could be coming with COVID than what we really have seen in the rest of the world. So hopefully some of that might have helped you with a little bit of experience, I'm not really sure. But um, as we said, you know, whether it's going to be in the hangar or not, like we talked about, you know, you're starting to get to high winds, that sort of consideration outside, man, I mean, that's where it changes and it becomes quite difficult because how are you going to relocate? And as Phil said, every trip from Hong Kong or Singapore becomes an international trip. I mean, it can be really quite difficult. Another part of the... Um, the requirements on some aircraft are taking into account heavy rain. And I know that might be news for some people, but there's actually requirements in uh, some of the manual and the manual for the Global Express to do some maintenance around heavy rain and that sort of thing. And that sort of stuff, it's not like you can just simply schedule the airplanes down. I, I'm going to go back out in 14 days because if these weather events come, you've always got to be prepared for them. So most of it is not particularly difficult. It's just really being in a situation where you're able to, to address the problems and have the right qualified people to be able to do it. Yeah, not, not just the COVID uh, situation, but with aircraft that cannot park inside and they are in places where there can be torrential rain, um, some of those actions, I mean, your maintenance requirements obviously need to change. Um, that, for example, there's a lot of bulletins on certain aircraft about water ingress and sealing up and drain holes being uh, drilled into certain panels and things like that. Obviously, if you're parking outside, this is something uh, that you should really look into and make sure the aircraft is up to the latest uh, specifications with uh, protection against water ingress and draining. So it's quite interesting, I think, when you start looking at some of these um, requirements that the, the downside or the maintenance effect can be a lot further down the track than just simply, you know, in today or the first flight or the first week. And certainly fuel tanks is one of those areas. And um, there's just a couple of slides up here where you can see a bit of, you know, the microbiological corrosion. This was a Falcon 900 that sat around. I believe it had about of a third of a tank of fuel. And it sat for a very long time in a uh, humid country and the microbiological growth had a great time. And as you can see, it came in for a sea check into Duncan Aviation and they found corrosion on the lower wing planks on the fuel tank side. And it actually resulted in, in the lower wing skins having to be replaced. So it's yeah. something that you really need to consider. And there are guidance in the manuals for this, but it's something to not, um, just don't overlook it. And it's like the, you know, treatments with viable or that sort of thing. If you can fill the tanks up to a higher capacity, that's great because it's less room for um, any, humid air to be building up with water in, you know, for the, into the fuel. You need to make sure that you do your fuel drains, that sort of thing. It's important to keep the fuel drains up because the problem is if you leave them for a long time, then as we know, the O-rings become dry and you can end up with leaks when you try and do a fuel drain later on. So it's just really important to keep on top of that. And although it's not a particularly, um, it's not a, a subject that you're going to see the results of quickly, but you'll certainly see them in the very long term. And it's a pretty expensive pastime trying to repair it. Can, can I just touch on that, Richard, that it's, you know, these sorts of issues you see with uh, the lower wing skins being corroded, this is a, a byproduct of aircraft that sit around too long. Now, if aircraft are flying regularly and the fuel is 
turning turning over regularly and they're, they're, they're vibrating, the fuel's moving around, the fuel's being burnt. You, you don't see this. But now we're parking for extended times. Um, and, and a lot of business aircraft do park a lot. They might not fly so much. So again, another recommended practice is you know, increase increase that frequency. So there might be a requirement from the OEM to do buy a ball, let's say once every 12 months. But during these situations where you aren't flying and you don't have that natural protection, uh, it, it's worthy to bring those frequencies forward to prevent uh, you know, the corrosion happening inside the tanks. No, that's great. Um, one of the things that we've also seen, which is quite interesting, is the manufacturers, some of them actually um, recommend that you'd have like a 90% fuel load and stuff for parking, and it helps with right. mooring, that sort of stuff. That's fine. But one of the other parts is what do you do with all that fuel when you don't need it for your next flight? And I've certainly come across this um, at times where getting aircraft defueled can be a very difficult operation. And you just need to consider that. I'm not saying it's the wrong thing to do. It's just part of the whole process. And the other thing that's interesting, and I was on a discussion the other day, was about if you, some of the manufacturers ask for the longer term storage to keep the tanks 90% full. Well, if it's parked in a hangar 90% full of fuel, you know, how's the owner of the hangar going to feel about that when you've got an airplane full of gas sitting inside? It's, it's just something to consider. I'm not saying that it's wrong. It's just some people get a little nervous about that sort of thing. So as I said, getting defuel capability done, it can be difficult to get trucks. I know at Duncan, one of their facilities in Provo because they have got airplanes coming in all the time for heavy maintenance. They have the ability to take fuel from the airplane and uh, process it and have it ready, you know, like almost filter that sort of thing ready for the, to be able to use on the flight line for other operators. But in a lot of places, and I remember in the airlines, we had uh, defuel trucks, but realistically it came down to whichever airplane you took it off, that was the one that you put it back on. So it's just something to really consider that, um, that having a tank full of gas can actually be more trouble, a lot of trouble to try and deal with if your next flight is only a short one. One thing that's really often overlooked, and this um, we see this a lot just in basic um, maintenance really, is the paint and interior. And again, it's the protection for your airplane, it's part of safety, it's part of corrosion prevention, but as the airplanes are sitting around longer, this is something that you really do need to take some uh, care with. And, and one thing, especially I know up in um, some parts of Asia, it really can be very hard on paint. And so you will already have maintenance practices in place, but you just need to keep those up. And that's part of this whole active storage part of it is, is keeping that maintenance up. And it, and it really isn't just a case of, well, I can't fly now, so I guess I'm going to save a bunch of money on, on uh, maintenance. You've got to keep these things up and uh, the bright work, that sort of thing, keep it protected. So, yeah, it's just important to, um, to really maintain that sort of stuff. Interiors as well, the same sort of deal. You need to think about humidity, especially up where you guys are. That's why all the airliners go and park in Ellis Springs and places like that. Humidity is not good for the inside of especially a business aircraft. So you can get some leather treatments, that sort of thing to get that, to try and help the leather. Airing out the cabin on a regular basis is important. And especially things like it's pretty basic, but just removing all food, you know, make sure you dry out the ice bins all that sort of stuff to keep the bugs out and, and that sort of thing. You don't want to be leaving anything that's really basic and easy to kind to take care of, but just don't make it easy for all the insects and that sort of stuff. Um, one of the other parts as we've seen is as well is just basic things like closing window shades and just keeping that heat out as much as you can. And of course the flight deck, trying to, you know, having the window shades, uh, the windows covered as well just to make sure that you're for the sun protection and that sort of thing. So a lot of it's pretty simple and it's what you do anyway in day-to-day -day maintenance, 
you just got to keep remembering in that active storage, it's really active. And just to uh, jump in there, the it's, it's, uh, it does affect their worthiness and it is a massive commercial consideration. Anyone of you that may know me know that my favorite topic is uh, bright work and uh, staying ahead of that. Um, because by the time you notice that that's a problem, you're already talking about a lot of money. So for those that, uh, that aren't flying much and are sitting in potentially, uh, uh, you know, air environments with the not so clean air, um, with these sort of nasty particles, just, you know, keeping that, that bright work frequency uh, up and even more than normal is recommended during these parking times. So this is one of the things that I think is pretty interesting is the um, engines, of course, we all know that engines are one of the most expensive parts of the aircraft and the engines need to be run on a regular basis. It's all in the maintenance manual. It's definitely something that you can do. But again, it's part of making the plan. Make sure you've got the staff to do the runs or the crews or whatever it else. And the interesting thing is that this is not an optional activity. It's this is not something that you can choose that you might do or don't. You can choose not to, but the remedy for not complying is very expensive. And I've been through this before with, um, as a, I used to run an engine shop down in Western Australia. And you see it that when you haven't, when someone hasn't preserved the engines properly or hasn't complied with the runs and documented it properly, you can go to the manufacturers with, well, this is where we're at. And I can tell you they are not your friend when it comes to giving you a dispensation for this kind of thing. It's something that they're very strict on and the overhaul cost is very high. And also suddenly you're into that unscheduled engine work. And the interesting part is it's a little bit like an insurance claim when you have a FOD event or something like that. You may actually only have to go into the engines to access the mainline bearings, say, and replace those. That's kind of the cheap part. It's the parts that you find along the way, the nozzle guide vanes that are beyond limits, the combustors that are cracked. That's when the conversation starts to get quite interesting because no one wants to pay for that, but unfortunately you're in there now. So, and the power by the hour agreements like corporate care, JSSI, that sort of thing, they don't want to cover it and it all starts to get quite interesting. So as I say, again, it's just part of that activity there's nothing difficult about it. It's just a case of making sure you keep on top of it. And this was definitely something that we saw come out of the GFC in 2008. And also just really make sure it's well documented. Um, covers, that sort of thing. Phil brought up a great point um, when we were chatting about this yesterday about, you know, on it's all great saying put your covers on your engines, but you get into the globals, the G650s. That's a pretty high up and you know, it's, it's quite an effort getting those things on and off. And, and you also have to make sure you've got the right ground support equipment to do that. Cause it's not fair to be trying to put people up on ladders and bits and pieces, you know, to put covers on cause they are big, they're heavy, they catch the wind. So just again, it's just about being prepared. One of the other points that I think is worth considering is, is how those engine cycles from um, engine runs get treated. I remember being a bit of an old bugger now that, you know, back in the day with the older engines, nobody ever worried about any of that sort of thing. Line maintenance just did shift, did runs and that never got counted. But that sort of stuff, those days are gone and realistically making sure that you understand how to treat those uh, engine cycles in the logbook is an important thing. One thing to be honest is though, that at the end of the day, especially with the big aircraft, I think like the BR-17s, that sort of thing, they've got a lot of cycles on those discs and compared to what business jets are doing versus the commercial guys, you're not really burning up. It, it's, the, the cycles aren't overly precious, if you know what I mean, compared to you're not going to run out of time. But it's just important to really make sure you manage that well. Um, the main landing gear, again, it's just another activity to watch out for. Tire inflation, we've seen that especially, you know, check that it's per the maintenance manual. Uh, move the aircraft to rotate the uh, tires to prevent the flat spots. 
I've certainly seen a lot of people that talk about taking the airplane out, even if it's more or less for just a pre-flight, avionics run up, that kind of thing. And that's great because it means that the tires do end up tend to be, when you push it back in the hangar or park it back in a different spot, the tires do end up to not be in the same position where you left them. Just simply pulling the airplane forward a meter and pushing them back again to exactly the same spot isn't what they're looking for here. So you need to make sure that the tires are rotated at least and parked 90 degrees from where you were last time. And there's also some manufacturers ask for gear swings. So that's something that's quite interesting. Some people do, some don't. And again, it comes down to that brings on a whole new part of, you know, jacking airplanes, that sort of thing, and making sure you've got the whole logistical part around that. But again, it's, uh, it's all possible. It's just a case of making sure you have the right people, gear and equipment to do the job. So as you can see, there's quite a lot to this whole active storage um, program. Again, we've seen with um, avionics, uh, especially important to give them a run, looking through the manuals. It really is, I mean, if it's like without power for 14 days, some of the units, they ask you in the manuals to be running them, you know, two hours on, half an hour off, another half an hour on. It can take up to eight hours. So it's a considerable amount of time to do that in the day. Um, units like the DU-870s, you're supposed to, if you haven't got them in the airplane, if they're for 14 days, I think it is, you can... Um, it, sorry, I was reading one of the manuals, it was about taking them out of the aircraft and again, and putting them into storage. It's all quite a lot of work. You want to allow your IRSs to align, GPSs to come online, that sort of thing. Keep up with your software updates and all that sort of thing in the avionics systems. Nav database updates, we've seen that a lot. And especially people thinking that they'd like to go away from some of the COVID hotspots and park up for a while. Just doing that consideration of how you're gonna do nav database updates and who's gonna do them. I have seen, which is quite an interesting thing, where some customers were hoping to be able to have a mechanic come to wherever the airplane was parked, and even if there's no COVID restrictions getting them in, sometimes the mechanic has to do um, quarantine on their way home. And then they're stuck in quarantine for two weeks, the MROs won't send the guys down there. Because of that quarantine, they don't want them out of the hangar for that long. So it's just really interesting. It's all part of the whole puzzle to make sure and keep that keep that regular and who's gonna do it. Uh, batteries, that sort of thing, just obvious stuff, you know, what's a parasite on the power while it's in storage, all that sort of stuff. And so it's just a logistical challenge, even just getting power carts and power and hangers and that sort of stuff. It's just all needs to be considered. I think there's an interesting part here is about actually, sometimes you really just need to be looking, just take a step back, especially if the airplane's in the hangar or as you're walking out, it's just take a step back and, and look for signs of, you know, if it's on a bit of a funny lean and you've got one oleo down and one up, just, you know, you can kind of get so focused on, on I guess, the, the wood that you forget to see the trees. and. And that's the whole thing is just take a step back and look for unusual stuff. Is there any leaks? You know, what's that funny thing up on the tailplane and it's a bird nest up there. You know, it's just keep your eyes open and just don't, don't take things for granted because it is a different time. Also in the hangar, you know, if you've got a hangar and you're in that sort of flight department, it's just making sure you do the maintenance on that facility as well. You know, you've got tooling, interesting parts like tool calibration. It's all part of that thing. If, you, if you're doing some basic maintenance and then you aren't using a calibrated tool, you can again set you up for yourself up for that problems later on. Ground support equipment, making sure that it's well serviced and maintained. Chemical leaks, because you don't go out there very often to where the chemicals are stored. All that stuff, you know, it's just keeping up with it. There's nothing it's just in your day-to-day -day work, you would normally see that. But when these different times, it's just something that can be overlooked.
Uh, Richard, can I just jump in there? Uh, I'd just like to encourage uh, anyone that has any questions to uh, send them in via the Q&A button. Um, we're going to uh, record those and uh, go ahead and uh, answer them at the end of the presentation. Uh, but they take a little while to type out, so please uh, feel free to type them uh, as the presentation goes along. Thanks. Great. Now, that's, that's a great idea. Thanks, Phil. Um, one of the things that we've definitely seen is flight departments using regional flights to keep their airplanes exercised. Um, I did have one uh, customer of mine saying, well, he's paying by the, for the power by the air contract anyway. They've got minimum hours to use, like might be 150 hours a year or that sort of thing. They've kind of used that. You're chucking a bit of extra fuel and, and that's all it really costs. So it's something that's worth considering because as well, crew currency, and as Phil's always, he's talked about as well, is that really the best thing for the airplane is to keep it flying, keep it active. And that just means trying to schedule that. I don't know if it's that big a problem up where you guys are, but certainly in some parts of the world, the optics of being seen to be flying around in a global express just to exercise it, and perhaps parts of other parts of the company or the country aren't doing that well because of COVID and the economic uh, impacts. It's just something that uh, I know some flight departments will consider. Other ones, of course, it won't be an issue for them. So just worthwhile, just, you know, it's just one of those considerations. And this is extremely important. The, the, um, the GFC really brought this into place is to make sure that you document what you've done. We have seen this and it's, it's the old story. It's, it's kind of easy to do at the time, but if you don't keep on top of it, people change, things kind of get missed and you really need to keep it documented properly and keep a really good log of what you've done and keep it in the logbook or in your maintenance program. And that was certainly something from the GFC and it's been very hard to uh, prove later on. And it pre-buys, that's the premium time where it could be two, three, four years down the track. You could be upgrading your airplane, looking to sell this one. And I know that the people who are doing pre-buys are looking out for this kind of thing. And they did it in the GFC and they'll be doing it again for the COVID slowdown saying, well, look, we all knew everybody didn't fly much in 2020. Can you just show me what you did during that period? And it's a very, very important to do because it is so difficult to go backwards from that point and try and uh, re, you know, think of what do we do and all the rest of it, and then who did it and who's going to sign for it. So again, just keep on top of that and it'll make your life a lot easier. Okay, so I'd like to run through some examples of the requirements that are out there. Uh, I'm sure for a lot of you that are looking after aircraft in the camo sense or in your own flight department uh, are already aware of these, but I can tell you that during this period, uh, I had a few moments of, oh, I didn't know that, or gee, that's an interesting requirement. So it's, uh, we're trying to just run through a few just to sort of encourage um, everyone in our industry to make sure that they're having a look uh, at the the AMMs, uh, the you know the advisories from the OEM, and making sure that you know you're keeping your aircraft um, up to speed with with these various requirements. And there are very different approaches from different OEMs. Uh, so as a first example, G450 uh, flight ready. Now this is flight ready storage. I think as Richard said, not too many people going into long term storage, but this is a, quite an extensive requirement. I mean, essentially, if you read through the procedure, it's every day, check the aircraft, looking for chocks, covers, uh, every three days, engine runs, uh, every 15 days. I mean, there's more than just this, by the way, but this is just an example of what's included. We're talking about uh, rotating wheels um, and then, you know, lubricate exposed, exposed portions of flight control, pistons every 30 days. And then at 60 days, you've got the landing gear cycling, which requires you to jack the aircraft. If you have not flown the aircraft, you need to do the jacking and the gear cycling. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, so Bombardier, uh, this was uh, from their, their advisory wire, uh, 10 2 Rev2, which was uh, tied in recently with COVID uh, impact. 
Uh, so 604, 605 Challenger. Uh, essentially, it's a 14-day parking cycle with engine runs, taxis. Uh, and then after you've done eight cycles of 14 days and you've got to look at fuel samples. Um, interestingly, the maintenance manual says that after 61 days, you've got to, you have to pickle the aircraft, you have to put it in long-term storage. But this uh, advisory wire has basically superseded that to say that this could go on indefinitely um, until further notice. So that's, uh, that's good news. Uh, on the global, it's a 30-day cycle with engine runs, taxi. Oh, sorry, we just jumped back there, Richard one. Uh, so yeah, engine runs, taxi on 30 days and uh, after four cycles of 30 days, again, fuel samples. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so that, again, two different, very, two very different approaches from, uh, from OEMs. Um, so again, this is what's written at the bottom, valid until international flight restrictions are lifted in an aircraft regime, normal operation. So that's in accordance with the advisory wire, which you can easily get if you're a Bombardier operator. Sorry, next slide, please. So over to the engines, uh, GE CF-34. Uh, this is a very specific one that uh, I'd like to share because uh, this, the statement there is that the engines have to be operated above 70% N1 for more than 10 minutes within every 30 day period. However, if the, if the engines are put into a short term storage, then the engine run must be operated above 70% within every 90 days. Now, the definition of short-term storage when you look in the manual is actually having the engine covers on, but you've got to put the engine covers on uh, within a short period. So after you land, the engine covers have to go on quite promptly, and that will give you the extension where you don't have to do that, that uh, high power run every month. Uh, but if you don't have the covers, you're, you're going to be obliged to do that high power run. So, you know, it's, it's the engine manufacturers, it's, it's a big part of it is covers. Um, Next one's uh, the uh, Rolls-Royce. I'm uh, oh, sorry, back one, Richard, please. Yep, so uh, 710, 725, Tay, very similar with each other. Um, so generally speaking, the, you know, covering the front and rear of the engines after grounding, uh, this protects, you know, the, the ingress, the birds, all that sort of thing, we know about that. Uh, and then the engine run every 30 days at least, and up to six months, or full engine preservation with moisture control. So if you look at that, I mean, these engines are obviously on the Gulfstream and on the, on the global, um, but the, o, the OEMs, the, the airframe OEMs are suggesting that you do runs a lot more frequently than that. Um, but this is, you know, this is straight out of the uh, manufacturer's recommendations. All right, over to you, Richard. So just, um, and like we all know, you know, airplanes don't like sitting around and and they it mean making them work on a regular basis is it makes them a lot more reliable. So we've just got to really think about that as far as the reliability and that sort of thing and keeping your accounts like if you're on a parts like um, you know the Bombardier smart parts that sort of thing if you're on those programs just keep them up to date work with those guys as to how that's going to do because it really is all about the whole the whole team, you know, because through this whole thing, everybody's kind of out of their routine. It's because this is really a whole team effort and we need to consider that as you start working back into the operation, is just making sure that I guess people are more vigilant. It's not just your everyday stuff that you've been used to day in, day out as we were before and just trying to keep keep that, I guess, get that routine back but without missing things. Because again, that's part of the whole safety aspect of it is just um, those basic things that you always did. We just need to be really careful of them. And then again, I think, you know, after airplanes haven't been operating for a while, it's just that support plan, you know, it might not be the best idea. First trip out of the box to be a three week tour around Europe and, um, and a quick trip to the States and backs and forwards and you don't really know anybody it's just about perhaps easing your way into that, if that's possible. I guess with the owners, they dictate what happens. But all I'm saying is you just need to be a little aware that the chances of failures could be higher. So just remember to um, have your backup plans in place. As we talked about earlier with um, long-term storage, it's really something we haven't seen much of as far as the real true button up. I mean, I haven't come across anybody. I don't think Phil has. It's all in the manual. 
I mean, it's in the, the manufacturer's requirements. There's a lot to it. And actually a lot of people that I've talked to have said, there's so much to long-term storage that I think I'd rather just keep the active storage going. And you can see why the airlines send their airplanes to places like Ellis, Victorville, that sort of thing, because the climates are a lot warmer, drier, settled, that sort of stuff. But in the business aviation world, most people, you know, have really wanted to keep in that active flying or active storage um, area. So again, it's just in this slide, it's quite interesting. Some of the, the you know, the 14 day and monthly maintenance tasks still have to be completed in the long-term storage. It, as I say, it's such a big job, you're almost better off just to stay in that, uh, in that same consideration where you were. So this is one part that I know it's not particularly um, along the safety line, but it is part of it as well, is really thinking about the commercial considerations of, your, of the program. One of the things that you need to think about is that if your airplane's leased or financed, you know, is part of that, the terms of the agreement is to keeping your airplane in an airworthy condition. And actually that becomes part of what's quite interesting is putting it in storage, maintain that, it's just interesting to consider that and think about how is that going to affect my lease or finance arrangements. I'm sure if you work with your you know, financiers, that sort of thing, you'll easily work it out. It's just something to consider. And again, it's the same thing with the power by the hour agreements. I know a lot of them now are much more um, diligent on every year, tallying up what you've used, what you haven't, any pull up fees, that sort of thing. But it's just something to really consider and work with your um, providers on, especially, you know, exercise flights, that sort of thing. Some people feel like they've already paid for it, so I might as well use it up. And this, um, this next slide is just, it's, it's not an ad for JSSI, it's just that they happened to put out a communication on it, which I thought was interesting and a bit more proactive, and I believe a lot of this was driven because of some of the uh, activities from the financial crisis, there was a lot of the financial companies and power by their companies that found themselves in some difficult situations. So I believe that they've done quite a lot of learnings from that. So if you are on those programs, just consider how that's gonna impact your operation. So really just from my point of view, um, yeah, I just think it's just, it's quite a, a big subject in some ways. A lot of people, especially for you guys up in Asia that are on low utilization airplanes, you'll be doing almost the active storage in your normal operations, let alone during a pandemic. But just something to really consider, there's quite a lot to it. None of it's really that difficult. It's just a case of making sure you've got a good plan in place. So I'd just like to thank you for your time here. I'll hand over to Phil for his thoughts and uh, we'll take any questions. Uh, yeah, so please uh, type your questions in and send them in. We'll get uh, back to you right after we've finished. Uh, my, my final thoughts are, uh, you know, make sure you document the situation. Uh, if, if you don't document the situation, when that aircraft goes to sell, even if it's uh, two or three years from now, uh, you know, if you can't prove that you were keeping your airplane flight ready and you didn't put it into long-term storage, uh, Questions will come during the PPI. This is we've seen this before. Um, the other question, which we haven't really touched on, is what if your aircraft has exceeded uh, the requirements? If there's something you haven't done, you haven't kept it up to speed, um, then you know really the next step is to go back to the OEM, create that engineering order, and say, okay, I haven't complied. What are my required steps? Uh, in, which, in which case they will come back to you and say, yes, please do A, B, C, D, E to return the aircraft to, uh, to airworthiness status. So if, if there are exceedances, contact your OEM and uh, they can steer you in the right, in the right direction. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that, you know, what's written in the, in the manuals uh, in chapter five, the time limits and maintenance checks, uh, they're all minimums. So if, if you're in camo and you're controlling the maintenance, remember that they're minimums. They say, okay, you need to do buy a ball once a year. Well, have a look at your situation. Uh, what is it, is it prudent to do it twice in the year instead of once? Because the aircraft is parked and it's not getting that, um, that normal aircraft operation to prevent um, biological growth sitting in one place on a wing panel for weeks at a time. 
So, you know, these are the things, think outside the box, think outside the minimums, um, extra lubes, uh, taking care of your fuel and, to, and following the manufacturer's requirements um, is the best way to keep the airplane safe. Also reliable and to make sure that when the airplane goes to sell at some point down the road that, um, that it's a clean sale and uh, you're not going to be you know, caught in a trap uh, because you missed some issues uh, during this long-term parking period. So thank you very much for joining us. We do have a couple of questions coming in. Uh, first one is, uh, all these talking points show a plane with low utilization is still better uh, off than a stored one. Have, how have clients responded to recommendations for regular exercising flights? Uh, that is actually an excellent question. Um, in my opinion, the recommendation is, for example, uh, with Gulfstream with a gear swing every 60 days, uh, if you've got flight crew available and the airplane's in a place where it can be done, the ideal situation is to, to fly the aircraft uh, periodically. Some would say more, some would say less, but to me, if you've got a 60 day requirement to jack the aircraft and swing the gear, that's a good opportunity to trigger a local flight and take care of that requirement and exercise the rest of the systems in their natural environment, uh, as opposed to, uh, to doing band-aid, I call it band-aid work, you know, main, trying to maintain the airplane on the ground. Um, and I would say, to answer your question, Tom, I would say it's, uh, it's been a uh, mixed, mixed reaction. Some, some uh, people are, I don't want to fly, I don't care. Uh, I want to save the money and others uh, would have, you know, if you recommend it, let's do it. So it's definitely mixed reactions. Uh, okay, so there wasn't a question answered there by, from someone uh, about the how well did the OEMs cooperate with operators in parking procedure deviations? Uh, really quite well. Uh, from what I've heard around the traps, uh, it, you know, it, you just go to them and say, look, I've, I've got this issue. I wasn't able to, um, I wasn't able to uh, do the work on time because of a situation we couldn't get crew in there. I mean, some aircraft are parked in places where we can't get the crew in uh, or you know, for a while or the, another situation, you might be up, might not be able to get the airplane to any maintenance location. So you might need those extensions and there might be a requirement for a no technical objection to ferry the aircraft uh, gear down or whatever. Uh, so th there's always a way to get an airplane out. Um, I shouldn't say always a way, there's nearly always a way to get the airplane out, even if it has sat beyond, uh, if you are deviating uh, from the OEM requirements. I think the big thing with that, Phil, like you say, is try and address that earlier if possible. The earlier you can get onto it and the earlier and, and alert them to if you've got a problem coming is the better way to go than trying to go back afterwards. And I know that's especially true for engines. If they haven't been um, preserved properly or ground run turned over, it can be difficult to get the OEMs to give you some leniency on it. So the earlier you can address it, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, and to that end, if you if you actually start, to, you know, if the requirement is because you haven't run the engines, that you have to start doing boroscopes, which you wouldn't normally have to do at that particular point, and then you find something else uh, that might not be related to the storage. Uh, of course, uh, you're opening up Pandora's box, and uh, it's going to can end up costing you a lot of money, in, indeed. Okay, I think we'll leave the floor for another minute or so. Any more questions? Any more opinions on this? Has anyone run into any uh, challenges they'd, they, uh, they'd like to share? Very good. Well, again, I hope it was helpful. Uh, uh, somewhat obvious for, for a lot of people, but out there, as I said, a lot of people have uh, absolutely run into a few challenges adapting to these requirements, uh, myself included. So. Uh, Hopefully we've, uh, we've brought some awareness to this very important topic and uh, keep the fleet as safe as possible. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you. Thank you very much to Richard and Phil for their joint presentation. Uh, with no further questions, uh, we'll be back shortly with our next speaker.